thank you so much for joining us. Today is a wonderful day for me because I get to dialogue with uh, one of my, my heroes, really. And, uh, and I'm so glad that you're joining us. Uh, the theme that we're going to talk about is peace or pieces, the choices before us in this moment of time. And uh, so I'm going to give a, an accurate introduction to Dr. Jane Goodall, scientist, but appropriately a United Nations messenger of peace for the world. So that's more than just the science of learning the uh, objective phenomena of the world. It's a title that appropriately, appropriately uh, is bestowed on her to talk about peace for the world. Now, when you introduce uh, people, you, you know, they, 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 some people say we, and uh, when they say we, they mean their group, their political party, their gender, their race, their nation. But when Jane says we, it literally means everybody on the planet, but more than that. It's not just all of the people, all of us, but it is also all of the other living beings that live on the planet. And Dr. Dr. Goodall uh, has devoted her life to studying how we have to live with each other and live with all the other living gifts from the creator that live with us here. So Dr. Goodall, uh, would you please give us a greeting to begin our meeting? I will give you the greeting that I think you expect from me to immediately incorporate beings other than human beings uh, straight from the forests of Gombe. <laughs> me, Jane. Um, we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, before you say another word, it's wonderful for me to be able to speak with you because you're one of the people I truly admire who's devoted your life to fighting for peace, perhaps in the most difficult way there is, the abolition of nuclear weapons, because that is a very, very hard thing to actually fight when you think of the people in power today. So I just want to say I'm thrilled to be talking with you. Thank you. I don't. I. I, I believe that uh, peace is a holistic endeavor. That it's impossible for us to uh, to work for peace without working and achieving peace within ourselves. Because all of the activities that humans uh, do to either nurture or destroy the planet come from the inner state that we first have, and that's why I want to begin this with a poem that was gifted to you, that you shared with me, that is just amazing instructions for all of us. Uh, this is a poem that, that, uh, that Jane wrote when she was an adolescent, and it, it's like life instructions. And the other thing, Jane, it seems to me you actually followed these instructions. That's even, that, that's also pretty amazing. So here's this poem that most of us who uh, have read Jane's books and studied and seen Jane's movies and things, this is sort of the inside scoop. The poem is titled The Eternal Eye. When the night wind makes the pine trees creak and the pale clouds glide across the dark sky, go out, my child, go out and seek your soul the eternal eye. For all the grasses rustling at your feet and every flaming star that glitters high above you, close up and meet in you, the eternal eye. Yes, my child, go out into the world, walk slow and silent, comprehending all, and by and by, your soul, the universe, will know itself the eternal I. Uh, Jane, um, the integrity of your life, your journey, in, your journey in the forests of Africa, traveling the world over, creating schools for children, to me, they are, in a sense, uh, 
the, the living with integrity to this gift you were given as a child. And I wanted to get right into the most important thing that we're talking about today, peace or pieces. Where we are today in the world that you think we should be concerned about and what are the ways that we can move toward peace to ensure that we don't end up in pieces? Well, of course, as we have this conversation, Jonathan, we're living through some of the darkest times, I would say, for, for, for me personally, since World War II. Sadly, for other people around the world, what's happening now has been happening to them for a very long time. And the world isn't a peaceful place right now. As you say, you can't do much about it unless you have a sense of peace within yourself. And sometimes I feel guilty having a sense of peace because so many people, that's very far away from what they, they, they might be able to find for themselves. But one thing's very clear. Part of the problems we're going through today is this pandemic, COVID-19, and an even greater threat to our existence on the planet is climate change. And both of these, at least in part, have been because of our absolute disrespect of the natural world and our disrespect of the animals with whom we should be sharing this planet. And so it's, it's our disrespect of the natural world, cutting down the forests, forcing animals into closer contact with people, hunting them, killing them, eating them, trafficking them, selling them in the wildlife markets, creating conditions in our factory farms, which are like concentration camps for animals. And in these conditions, it's a perfect environment for some kind of pathogen with COVID-19, it was a virus, to jump from an animal to a person. And this particular virus bonded with a cell in the human body, created the new disease. It happens to be very contagious. But so that's our disrespect of, of animals and the natural world. And, you know, the thing is that that Mother Nature provides, as Mahatma Gandhi said, for human need, but not human greed. And in the so-called developed world, we have been ruthlessly extracting these finite natural resources in a very unrealistic and unsustainable way. And I think until we can learn to move into a, a new relationship with the natural world, we'll never find peace. It, you know, with climate change, water supplies are drying up. And I've heard many people say the next wars will probably be fought over water. And there's so many things out there today which could lead to more war and to more violence. So it's desperately important to give a, a hopeful message because if we all lose hope, that's the end. It'll be the end of us without hope. What's the point of doing anything? When every mother looks into the eyes of their child, they not only have hope for the, that child's future, but that power of love that, that it causes them to get up at three in the morning and take care of that child is spontaneous. When uh, my wife and I, every day now, you know, we're quarantined, but every day we go out for a walk to renew our connection with the natural world because it's so important for our own uh, for our own psychological and spiritual nourishment to remember that uh, that we are part of the whole. If there's one thing this pandemic teaches us, it is that the living systems of the earth are borderless. This uh, virus does not carry a passport. The climate doesn't, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not a property of one country or another. There are people and there are leaders in some countries that want to have a vaccine apartheid world where, where you know, walled countries with very wealthy people living in walled communities, with walled mentalities will have privileges to the vaccine while masses of people suffer. Mass, the capacity of indifference 
the spiritual poverty of much of the wealthy world is striking. Today, there are over 65 million displaced people from war, refugees, more than ever in human history, more than even in World War II. We don't see, they're invisible. They're invisible because of indifference. For them, the catastrophe of World War III, in a sense, has already happened. They're living in desperate, desperate conditions. But it really has to do with a sense of, with not being connected, not being at peace and connected to the spirit, connected to the sense of the sacred and the great value of one's own time in life. The, the, uh, the fact that we live with it now with this uh, ex explosive virus of excessive nationalism, the, you know, the, the modern state was created in the 17th century to stop the fanatic war between Protestants and Catholics in Europe arguing as to whose definition of Jesus' love was better. So the modern state was created in the treaties of Westphalia in, the, in 1648 in order to help people live better together. Today, these global threats, like protecting the climate, dealing with pandemic diseases, it appears to me, require that states, instead of walling themselves off, truly recognize that we are one human family and that we have to live together, and that we have to follow, as you, as you cited, one of the great wise of our time, Mahatma Gandhi, what we do to the least amongst us is the most important thing, that our policies have to look to the most dispossessed, the poorest, and take care of them. If, if we focus on that, uh, if we focus on policies that lift up the most marginalized, as a responsibility, all the rest follows, in my opinion. You know, uh, we're the first generation that could be the last, you know, in our lifetime because of the nuclear bomb, but we're also probably the first generation that has the technical, the technical capacity to eliminate poverty. So the choice is kind of, are we gonna treat the human family as a family, as one, or are we going to break off into um, religious, national, ethnic tribes and try and fight it out. Um, Jane, you, you've studied a great deal of, uh, of our closest relatives, uh, chimpanzees, right? And how do they work things out? Well, they're, they're, they're so much like us, Jonathan that I would never go to a chimpanzee to learn how to be a better human because uh, we, we have a common ancestor and we brought not only the good, loving and altruistic traits from that common ancestor, but also the violent and warlike and brutal traits as well. And, you know, so the chimpanzees like us have a dark side and, and a, a noble side. Um, unlike us, they can't sit down and discuss how they should move together to a better, closer together future. We can. We haven't used that intellect that we've been gifted with. And we've gone off into materialism. And, you know, you talk about this generation ending perhaps because of nuclear war. But future generations will end because of climate change if we don't do something about it. And yes, you talk about ending poverty, tremendously important. We've got to end poverty. We've got to do something about the unsustainable lifestyles of everybody else. And we've also got to realize that right now there's 7.2 billion of us on the planet. We're already using up finite natural resources in some areas faster than people can replenish them, faster than nature can replenish them. And if in 2050 the prediction is true that we'll be closer to 10 billion, 9.7 billion is what I've heard, human beings on the planet, you know, what is going to happen? So with regard to alleviating poverty, the only way to protect the natural world 
is to alleviate poverty. And I came to that realization flying over Africa, particularly the little Gombe National Park where I'd done the research, which in 1960, this little park was part of a great forest belt stretching across Africa uh, to the West Coast. And when I flew over in the early 90s, it was a little tiny island of forest and it was surrounded by completely bare hills, more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere. And that's when I realized if we don't help these people find ways of making a livelihood without destroying the environment, we can't even try to save the chimps or any other animals. Because, you know, if you're really poor, you probably understand perfectly well that if you clear trees on a very steep slope, you're going to get terrible erosion because people living on the land know these things and you're going to get the stream silting up. But if you're desperate to feed your family and the farmland on the lower slopes is overused and infertile, you're going to cut down the trees anyway. You're going to fish the last fish. Or if you're living in a city, the urban poor, they're going to buy the cheapest junk food because they have to try and survive. So we've got to alleviate poverty. And my biggest hope for the sustainability of the rest of us, for our lifestyle, is the young people that I work with all over the world. They get it. And they really are doing an awful lot to try and achieve a more sustainable lifestyle for people living in the, as I say, so-called developed countries. I don't know quite what's developed. I'm not sure that our morality is developed and certainly our spirituality is, is the opposite of developed. It's suppressed completely by many people. The uh, Nobel Peace Laureates hit on these three themes at a, at a summit they had in Chicago a few years ago and suggested, particularly to young people, that every political candidate that runs should have to answer three questions. One, what are you doing to protect the climate? Two, what are you doing to eliminate poverty? And three, what are you doing to eliminate nuclear weapons? If, 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 if those questions are asked, the other, many other issues get taken care of. Um, the current, the current uh, military budget in the world is ho hovers around uh, $1.7 trillion. It's, 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 it's almost inconceivable to count that amount of money. The United States alone is around uh, seven eight $800 billion a year. This, a small portion of this could actually eliminate poverty. And a small portion of this could actually change our relationship to the climate. But this is driven by, uh, by, by self-interest and fear. And people are not aware of the extent of the expenditures. The current administration in, in Washington has pledged $1.7 trillion to modernize the nuclear arsenal. And the eight other nations with these horrible weapons are similarly either expanding and or modernizing their arsenals. We're at the beginning of a new nuclear arms race, the consequence of which is nothing good. And it's, in, in my opinion, as General Eisenhower said, it's a theft from those who are hungry. It's a theft from those who are in need. And it's our responsibility to hold leaders accountable. And this is happening all over the world. This is not, and it's not a Republican or liberal or conservative issue. Um, it's a smart, dumb issue. It's a right, wrong issue. Where are we putting our, where are we putting our money? This is a time, I think, in which there's a, a moral responsibility for people to step up. If we don't address the climate, we can see, we can see what's happening today in California and the United States and Oregon and Washington. Large portions of, of, of these beautiful, beautiful states are literally on fire. Yeah. People can't go out of their homes in parts of San Francisco because the air is so toxic. Yeah. Um, I have a 14-month-old grandson there, and we're trying, and he has he's come into the world with a heart that reflects the reality of the world. He has a heart without borders as does any 14-month-old child. He has a heart without borders. But because of 
the borders of fear and greed that we've created, that he can't go outside and play. He can't go outside because it'll hurt his lungs. That's today. And it will only get worse if we don't, if we don't engage, if we don't stop this. It's been like that in many major cities in the world, not because of the fires, but because of the emissions, the use of fossil fuel and all the rest of it. And even now, with climate change clearly on the agenda of any civilized, thinking, thoughtful, caring person, mm -hmm. there are leaders in well, two countries that I know of, the US and Australia, and China, three, opening up coal mines, the worst pollutant of all. And so, you know, we're up against major powers, major forces, um, whether it's weapons or whether it's the pharmaceutical companies, uh, money, money, money. And so this is why so many people are depressed. And we're coming up to the international, the UN International Day of Peace. So the message that we have to put out, or that I feel I must put out, is, you know, what can I do is what people want to know. What can I do? And what, what the Jane Goodall Institute is doing, we are doing it and have been doing it for a long time, is alleviating poverty by helping people find ways of living without cutting down the forest, uh, with keeping girls in school with scholarships. It's been seen all over the world that as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. And one is accused sometimes of, of, of blaming the poor people for having large families. No, that's not it at all. I think these people who say that haven't seen the women today desperately struggling to raise seven children because they don't have the money, they don't have the land anymore, things have changed. And these people welcome family planning. The women do not want to be breeding machines. And I believe it's true that this Pope, who is really far-thinking, actually said in that huge rally in Manila that just because we can breed like rabbits doesn't mean we should. So, you know, I feel so passionately that we should help these people regulate the family. So I don't talk about birth control or anything like that. I talk about... I talk about... Um, uh, voluntary population optimization. You can't be blamed for saying voluntary population optimization. And so that's, that's something that we are doing in seven different African countries now. And then the other thing when it comes to climate change, where we could certainly use some of these trillions of dollars, which are just going to make the world worse and sinking us into the pits of hell, Mouths are yawning, aren't they? So trying to save forests, trying to plant trees. And you mentioned earlier, Jonathan, that we need the spiritual connection to nature. And it's absolutely true. So when you put green areas in a city, this was done in Chicago, two areas that were equally crime-filled uh, in, in very poor areas, one of those areas was was planted with trees and flowers every space they could crime rate dropped so then they quickly did the same in the other and you find when you go around the us and probably other countries too that when you go to the affluent parts of a city there's trees everywhere it's green it's beautiful you can sit out on the veranda go to the poorer sections no trees, no. So no wonder the crime goes up. No wonder people are angry because huge sections of the population have deliberately been kept down. They've been undereducated, underserved, and discriminated against. So all of these things, we have to find ways where people can get engaged in doing something because then they feel more help for undoing something to create a more peaceful world. And that's where the young people are coming in and working out ways in which they can create peace with nature and with each other. That, and that's so important that people feel involved. 
That's why your job, Jonathan, with nuclear weapons is so difficult, because how does a child get involved in that? They really can't. But they can get involved in planting trees. And so that's, that's, that's a tough, tough uh, task that you have, as I said at the beginning. <laughs> well, we do have some programs that people can get involved. Um, Absolutely right. It's nations build uh, nuclear weapons, uh, and and in democracies, people have the obligation to have their moral agency, their sense of right and wrong, uh, represented by their political leaders. So if there was ever a time in which it's necessary for every single person to uh, to, you know, if you've ever been and lived in a country that's full out authoritarian and totalitarian, you would know how precious it is to be able to vote. Oh, yes, Jonathan. I haven't lived in them, but I've been in them. I know what it's like. I, I, I absolutely know what it's like, and I absolutely know the fear of young people when they live in regimes like that. And I've read so much about it. And, of course, I grew up, I was only small, but the Nazis, it, it, it made an impact on me that has stayed with me all my life. I still remember so well the survivors of the Holocaust, those living skeletons, many of them they called Muslims, didn't they, who, who just had no hope left. Absolutely. And we're at the verge where there are people in, in major, major developed countries who are passionate about racial division and they want to exacerbate it. Yeah. Who uh, are who view themselves as different than the rest of the human family, and they want to impose their will on the rest of the world, and political representatives who are insensitive to human suffering, and who are environmentally irresponsible, have to be voted out of office. And this is not partisan. I mean, in the United States, it was Republicans who brought us the uh, the treaty to protect the ozone, the Montreal Protocol. Yeah. Richard Nixon, a Republican president, created the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Water Act, and most importantly, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, in which the nations of the world with nuclear weapons promised to negotiate their elimination. So fulfilling promises is very basic to the stability of the family or the law. And we, those of us who are advocating a more peaceful world, a world based on reason and cooperation, we have the law on our side. What we don't presently have is political leadership that is respecting the law. And it's, I think, the responsibility of every person to step forward now. You know, if we don't address climate, we're going to have literally hundreds of millions of refugees from areas of the planet which will become uninhabitable, desperately, 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 trying to find a place to live, and it will be utterly unsustainable. It's, this is not mere speculation. This is simply dealing with reality. It's happening, Jonathan. It's happening. These mm -hmm. climate refugees, they're, they're everywhere. And you know, you, we talked about the fires, terrible, terrible fires, but the effect of the hurricanes and the flooding uh, in other parts of, of the planet they're creating terrible conditions too, which was the island recently that was totally the Bahamas, wasn't it? Um, Bermuda, was it Bermuda, I think, was totally destroyed by that hurricane. I mean, it's, it's everywhere these effects of climate change, and we have to address them. And when we have leaders who deny that it exists or says it's nothing to do with us, even if it does exist, then if, if we're in a democracy, yes, young people can stand up and, and make demonstrations. But if you're living in a regime that's totalitarian, um, then you can't, you dare not, you want to, you feel like this. And that leads to hopelessness. So what I've tried to do with our young people in Roots and Shoots is to say, look, you can't change the world, you can't change your system. But what you can do is do something in your little area. You can clean up a river, you can remove trash, you can plant trees, you can reach out to those of different ethnic groups and different colored skin. 
you, you can do something in your own community. Hang on to your values and your time will come. Because it's, it's taking action that gives people hope. Again and again, people have come up to me and said, you know, once, once I did what you said, once I started actually doing something and realized that other people were doing something and realizing it all around the world, uh, then that gives me hope, they said. Now I promise you, I'll do my bit. And it's only if we all do our bits that we can hope to get out of this mess. And if everybody's sunk in depression because of the big major problems, and if people spend all their time looking at the global problems, then they have no hope to do something locally. So you, you have to twist around this saying, think globally, act locally. No, act locally. Then know that people around the world are acting locally, and then you dare think globally for the first time that together we can and together we will make this a better world. Uh, I would say act, perso act personally. <laughs> <laughs> right away, uh, right away you could take the principle, uh, love people, use things. Never love things and use people. It's all right to love things, but you must love people as well. But love people, use things, don't love things and use people. No, absolutely not. Never <laughs> use people. Never use people. Always use things. You know, when you think about that, it turns out not actually to be true. Because if you have a whole generation of young people who really get it, you want to use them to go out and be ambassadors, don't you? We're ambassadors, so we can use people in the right way. <laughs> well, yes, I understand your point. But as a personal, as a personal relationship, to see that human unity and harmony with other lives is, a, is an enormously high priority rather than exploitation. Well, I know exactly what you mean, but I was playing. I mean, yeah, you I'm with you. Have to play. You have to, and you also have to have a sense of humor. If we look at <laughs> humor. I mean, good, help the world. Absolutely, absolutely. But the idea, the idea that, that we have to begin with our own hearts and then act from where we are. I mean, every single young person, you know, listening to this, every person should call up two of their friends and say, I'm voting, are you voting? If you're voting, you call two people. Um, the Global Security Institute, where I'm president, we have a program called Move the Nuclear Money. And, uh, you know, there are institutions uh, that have huge pension funds in, and or endowments in universities and, and religious institutions. It's time that they at least had responsible investment policies. You know, the country of Norway has a pension fund that's the most, one, it's almost a trillion dollars, one of the most successful investment instruments on the planet. And it's for future generations. They developed it because of the windfall of profits from the North Sea oil, which they understand is not sustainable. So the money in that fund cannot be invested in enterprises that grossly violate human rights, like child labor and terrible things like that. Yeah. And, or enterprises that pollute the environment or enterprises that benefit from nuclear and other weapons of indiscriminate effect, landmines and cluster munitions. So they have put their money where their values are, and that fund has outperformed the market. So there's no argument that it's not profitable to invest correctly. I believe that, uh, that universities are an easy place for students to demand of the, of, the, of the endowments of the universities that they similarly have comprehensive, holistic investment policies, not just green on climate, but also human rights and nuclear weapons. The reason is that, new, first of all, let, let's just get one, people have to understand there's 14,000 of them right now, a little, around 14,000 in the world. If a mere 1% uh, of that arsenal were to be used, this, the hard science demonstrates that at least 5 million tons of soot would go into the stratosphere ending the agricultural base of the planet. And 
so that, that we've moved from mutually assured destruction to the knowledge of self-assured destruction. The weapons that we have are, are multiples of the power that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The triggering devices on hydronuclear bombs are as powerful as those weapons. Those weapons were about 15,000 tons of TNT apiece. We have weapons in the megaton, million ton, a million ton range, like 70 Hiroshima's in one weapon. Deployed on high alert, just like they were at the height of the Cold War. No discussion about it. It's imperative that we realize that not just the economic expenditure, but the highest expenditure is the division that it has between nations that have to cooperate, that are squaring off threatening annihilation on a daily basis. I was privileged to be at a small conference that the Pope, you mentioned the Pope, who, who is uh, Pope Francis, who's truly a great visionary on the subject of nuclear weapons, and he talked about how the mere possession is fundamentally immoral. And I started thinking about it, that you have to train thousands and thousands of young people to become ready, willing, able, and at the ready to annihilate the entire future of humanity. That cannot be morally acceptable. That cannot be morally acceptable. It all begins, I believe, Jane, with people's uh, being disconnected from their own power, their own power and, and responsibility to bring the intrinsic love that they have for one another and, 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 and sense of the sacred, that life is sacred, into action. And I have so much respect and love for you, Jane, because I have seen how Roots and Shoots, the program that you were alluding to, has gone all over the world, focused on, on, on giving young people a sense of their own personal empowerment, whether it's to plant a tree, to develop a program in their community. And, 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 and in the program that, I, that I've seen that you do, it emphasizes the important human quality of compassion the importance, the centrality of developing that quality. Rather than, I know when I was a kid, I, 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 was, I played sports and it was always, we have to win, 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 win. It was, you know, and if you lost a game, it was as if all the fun of the game was taken away. You know, you play a basketball game or a soccer match and if you lose, it's not supposed to have been fun. What kind of deal is that? It's worse now. It's worse now. Look at some of the professional sports. It's, it's real. It's war. It's actually war. <laughs> well, but but a lot of the athletes are stepping up and taking moral positions. Well, they are now, yes. The basketball players are wearing Black Lives Matter. The football players are taking a knee. Uh, you know, the, the, this, this idea of stepping forward with, 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 you know, calling for peace, it's catching on. Yes, that, that's why we need all these ambassadors out there, because when you get movie stars who are adored and, and fawned over uh, in so many countries, if they stand up and say, well, this is what you should do, then lots of young people are going to do that. So they are really useful. <laughs> Jane, your role in, in the world right now is truly exemplary, and I know that, uh, that you carry it so lightly. You carry it without any arrogance, and that's... It's not light. It's not light. Like, honestly, Jonathan, it's not light. Sometimes I feel weighed down. I mean, so many people say, oh, Jane, you're giving us hope, and I'm thinking, I've got to go on doing this, and you know, it's, so anyway, little symbolic things are helpful. I, I try and surround myself with symbols that are hopeful, so that I, I, need, I need to get that, the hope as well. And I get the hope from the young people. I get hope from the resilience of nature. It's unbelievable. If you give a place we totally destroyed, take, you mentioned Nagasaki. Uh, and Hiroshima, they're, they're beautiful now. This Absolutely. One, one tree survived Nagasaki and two trees survived Hiroshima. 
and there, you know, and this one tree that was virtually completely destroyed when the Twin Towers fell, and it was rescued by a friend of mine, and it's now in that, what do they call it? Um, Peace Park. Yes, the Peace Park. It's, we, it's, we went there, we went there for International Day of Peace together. And you saw that tree. And we prayed together there. Yes, we did. We, and, you, know, yes. you know, we actually prayed. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a group with a Secretary of State George Shultz and former Secretary of Defense William Perry called the Nuclear Prayer. And if you go to the internet, go to the nuclearprayer.org. Um, I think, you know, we shouldn't be ashamed to ask for extra help. We should not hesitate to ask for help that there is a creator, that there is a gift of this breath, that there is a gift of of, of pure love that we have, and it is, it's real. And the spiritual guidance is very real. I read this poem in which you were given perfect guidance at, I don't know, 15 or 16 years old. That didn't come from your imagination, Jane. And, no, and it's I told so you that, I told you, Jonathan. The poems I wrote were, came to me. They weren't anything to do with me. Right. There is a. There is a. There is. There is a God, and and she or he has been given a bad name. So let's not call it a name. It's a mystery. It's a source. It's a power. It's beyond our conception. But but it gives us life. Yeah, I, I call it a spiritual power. I feel it very strongly in the forest. It's something which. People, uh, the indigenous people, the Native Americans, the shamans, the gurus in India, they, every, they all share this sense of uh, understanding the spiritual power, the oneness. But it's a whole, we're part of the natural world. And in Western societies, we've tried to distance ourselves. We can manage without you, Mother Nature. You, we'll put a little wall around that and then that's fine. We can live, but we can't. We rely on nature for clean air, for clean water, for food, for shelter, for shade, for regulating the climate, for regulating the rainfall. We rely on Mother Nature and we go on destroying Mother Nature at the risk of the end of humanity. And honestly, uh, nuclear war may or may not come. But if we don't address climate change and give people hope that we can if we get together, then the world's going to fizzle out, like the, like the poet said, not with a bang, like nuclear, but with a whimper, because it won't happen suddenly. Well, the nuclear weapons are not about nuclear weapons. They're about a dysfunctional way of human beings trying to talk to each other and demanding that others do what they want. But you know what I mean. Absolutely, totally, totally. What I'm saying is exactly the same point, that we've got to, you know, we were both at the UN at the Millennium Summit, and one of our friends, a, a wise elder from the North, uncle, I think, Uncle Gangagak, came and, and I paraphrase what he said in the General Assembly and, and you were there, I saw you there. And, and as I recall, uh, he said uh, that his, his peoples have been living for tens of thousands of years in harmony above the Arctic Circle. And that they've observed recently, th this was before we've seen this massive melting of the ice cap with billions of gallons of fresh water pouring out. Uh, I was there, I, I was a witness to it two summers ago. I was in an expedition Me there and I, and I saw the massive, massive melting. And he, at the time he said, we're seeing lakes that shouldn't be here. But this was his point. He said, oh, my brothers and sisters from the South, you've developed a technology to melt the polar ice cap. When will you find and use a technology to melt your hearts? To melt the ice in the human heart. To melt the ice in the human heart. That's what he said. And I, I, he came to one of my talks, and I was quoting him as saying that. And he came up to me afterwards. He said, did I say that? And I said, yes, you did. He said, well, can I use it? <laughs> he said it. <laughs> yes, it was like the poem. It was perfect information that flowed through him. Yeah, then he forgot about it. <laughs> And I think that's that's the first duty we have is to uh, 
You know, I, uh, I met a great wise man named Bala for, who lived in the jungles of Sri Lanka. And he, he phrased it this way, separate from yourself that which separates you from others. Anger, falsehood, jealousy, miserliness, pride, vanity, separate us. And the same qualities that bring us together as humans, love, compassion, patience, tolerance, justice, humility, they bring us together with the deep spiritual part of ourselves. And Robert McNamara, former Secretary of Defense, wrote a book of what he learned from his journey in life. Remember, this is a guy who helped save the world in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but was part of the mistake of the Vietnam War, horrible thing. What he learned was, in, in his book, Wilson's Ghost, he said, the golden rule is imperative in our interpersonal relations, but it's also imperative in the relations between nations. And when you look at the policies in which nations treat each other with respect and caring, like the Marshall Plan after World War II, you end up with trading partners, stability, and honor. When you try and dominate them and punish them or crush them, like we did in Vietnam or Afghanistan, you end up with, or with after World War I, you end up with catastrophe. Yeah. And it's this, so the principles that are personal, spiritual uh, comfort, awakening, hope, and celebration, they are the same principles we have to apply in our, with our political leaders. There's no division. It's like, you know, it's like we can't be divided from nature or you can't breathe. Well, we can't be divided from our moral nature in our policies. It, it's, it's, it's the coherence and wholeness that we're seeking. And I think that's really what we must, uh, must bring into action now. We've got to bring the, well, Jane, you often say the biggest journey is what, from the head to the, to the heart? And now it's got to be the head, the heart, and the hand. The head, the heart, and the hand. I always say we can't attain our true human potential until our head works in harmony with our heart. If your head works in harmony with your heart, that automatically leads to giving, to working, to make the world a better place. Well, that's a perfect way to end this. We began with one of your poems. I'm going to recite, I'm going to recite a poem uh, uh, in accord with that. Okay? Yep. All right. The heart without the hand withers. We have to bring our love into action. The hand without the heart is dangerous. The human being operating disconnected from human qualities is a dangerous creature. But salt can be turned into sugar. The salt of a life in which there's betrayal, disappointment, discord, can be turned into a life of sweetness, the tears of salt, of suffering, into tears of joy and gratitude in a life of caring and service and love in action. May we, you and I, make that journey that Jane calls us to make from the head to the heart so that our hands can be the hands that heal and the hands that bring justice and peace and not pieces that bring peace into the world. And I, Jane, I want to get, make sure you have the last word in our sharing. All right, well, then my last word will be to everybody who's listening, just to remind all of us that every single day we live on this planet, we make some impact. And those of us who are not living in desperate poverty, we have a choice as to what kind of impact we make. And we can choose to make a light ecological footprint, which is what we must do to tackle climate change. And until we tackle and defeat climate change, or at least slow it down, then we'll never have peace. And peace we must have. So. If we all remember that each day we do make a difference, not as an individual, but collectively, then we move towards 
a better world for all living things.